All right, so welcome back to E75. This is lecture seven, JavaScript. So we started the course uh, doing things that were very much server side. We dabbled with some XHTML and CSS. Your first project was very much server side oriented. Uh, the Pizza Shops website, and we used a little bit of XML. And then recall that we, actually recall the present, we segued away from uh, using XML as our so-called database. We now have MySQL, a full-fledged <coughs> database engine running. Uh, we'll continue using that until the end of the semester. And now, today, we kind of come full circle and start putting more of the burden, more of the computation on the client side. So JavaScript is a client side uh, programming language. It's an interpreted language, which means what, really, in general? What does it mean for a language to be interpreted? What's that? So no compiler. So it's the contrast of com uh, compiled language. So compiled language like C or C++ or even Java uh, is, uh, is compiled such that you write source code that looks a little bit like English, looks like a C syntax, C++ syntax, but you run it through a program that then outputs essentially zeros and ones that the CPU itself in a computer directly understands. So by contrast, an interpreted language actually is not converted to zeros and ones, at least not by you, but rather you run your code through an interpreter, which a program that reads it from top to bottom, left, and left to right, and does what that code tells it to do. So we've actually seen another interpreted language already besides JavaScript, which is what? Yeah, so PHP. So one of the advantages of these very popular web-oriented languages, JavaScript, PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby, is that they are interpreted, and they lend, and then they lend themselves as a result to fairly fast developments. There's no build file that you need to run just to make one tweak to your code and then redeploy your application. You tweak your code and voila, it's deployed because the, uh, the scripts are simply reinterpreted. So we'll see and we'll talk later in the semester about scalability because you do pay a bit of a performance penalty that can vary based on how complex your code is. But what you gain is development time and just ease of development, among other things. Um, at the same time, um, there are ways of mitigating that, as we'll discuss in scalability. You can install what are called PHP accelerators, for instance, which will simply cache the result of what the interpreter is doing. Yes, a lot of interpreters do pretty much compile your code, but at the very last second, when the user actually requests that page so that it can then execute it on the server and deliver the results. So we will talk briefly about some of these kinds of accelerators, and those actually help mitigate those kinds of concerns. And even JavaScript now, it's actually becoming even more common for people like Apple and Mozilla to actually talk about just how good their JavaScript engines are. When they release a browser, I mean, one of the oft-touted features these days is just how well the JavaScript interpreter performs, especially on mobile devices where you have fewer uh, resources available to you. And as we'll see this week and next week and the week after as we segue to Ajax itself, there's a lot more being done on the client, a lot more being done in JavaScript and a lot more data being sent back and forth, and you kind of need to be able to parse that quickly unless the user is going to notice essentially spinning progress bars and the like. So it's an interesting topic that's now come up from a language that you know, five, ten years ago, JavaScript was used for what in websites predominantly? Any? What's that? Yeah, annoying scrolling things, right? There was the whole thing in like the late 90s, early 2000s, like pop-ups everywhere on every possible site until finally they got rid of that nuisance. And now it's coming back in different forms and Flash and CSS and all of this. But JavaScript was kind of a toy language early on, at least so far as web development goes. But it's really matured. And actually, I would actually say that it's my favorite language at the moment just because you can do really interesting things with it, especially because there's so many popular APIs out there, a lot of them, frankly, coming from Google that take advantage of JavaScript. So we'll learn uh, both in lecture and through the projects about various features of JavaScript, but you also sort of learn indirectly by playing with APIs like Google's. Um, just to give you a little teaser, for project three, we'll play with Google Maps. And Google Maps has a very rich API, application programming interface. And I'll just give you a little teaser here. And it's not an API you're going to have to learn the entirety of, because there's way more functionality in there than we'll need. But just to give you a sense, this is the documentation for Google Maps. These are all the classes. Now, JavaScript does not actually have classes, per se. It's what's called a prototype-based language, but it definitely has features of an object-oriented language. So there's actually a lot of functionality in there, and Google's done, a, frankly, a good job, very good job of documenting their code. Uh, one criticism is that they put all their documentation on one page. Um, I'm sure there are better approaches than that, but Control F or Command F will be your friends by the end of the semester with that. But you can do really neat things. In fact, um, 
I mean, this thing here, which I think I brought up in an er earlier class and we linked to on the course's own website, this is our own version of Harvard's campus using Google Maps' API, whereby we use in this square here the Google Maps engine and the clicking and the dragging that this interface supports is all thanks to Google, not at all thanks to me. What I did was simply chop up a really big image of Harvard's map and lay it on top of here. And as you'll notice, you know, Harvard is only so big, and so eventually you do kind of fall off the edge of Harvard. But it's Google Maps' API nonetheless. And some of the undergrads have actually used this interface. Even though this isn't, it's kind of an abuse of what Google intends it for, it still works. Um, the houses, the dormitories on campus, a lot of them have floor plans that the students care about because when they do the housing lottery, they'd kind of like to know what their room's going to look like, how it's laid out, how big it is, and all of this. So we've actually, in previous semesters, had students overlay not um, like actual maps like this, but floor plans just because they really like the drag and drop interface. And you can actually program against this. And among the features of this thing are, if I want to search for like my old dorm, I can type Mather House. And this little drop down that you actually get is the result of another JavaScript trick, uh, Yahoo's YUI library, which we'll also preach in the class, uh, if only because um, the course is a big fan of it, because it really simplifies some development time. So lots of fun stuff in the pipeline. And especially now, as you're starting to think about what would be interesting for you for final projects, I mean, keep an eye out on various websites that you visit, things that are popular, whether it's Google stuff or Facebook or Yahoo or whatever, because there's a lot of fun uh, APIs and data sets out there that you yourself can play with. So a few of you took advantage of this, but if you haven't um, realized that you are welcome to join this other course, um, for some of our seminars. If you go to wiki.cs50.net slash seminars, some of these are targeted more at a, a C, the language C based audience, but a lot of them are web oriented. Uh, some of the seminars have already happened. Some of them will soon happen. Just follow the directions on this page. For those of you who are local, if you'd like to attend some of these, maybe just for your own edification or because you think you might be able to leverage it for your final project in this class, um, just scroll down and you'll see we've got bunches of seminars this semester, some of them about, um, say, Android or iPhones or Hadoop. Uh, data applications, scraping data from the internet. There's actually a lot of synergies between this class and, um, and this class. So feel free to take advantage of these. And if you can't attend in person, especially if you're remote, we'll have um, videos of everything. And we have two years worth of videos of, on other topics. So it's a good resource, we hope, if you want to take advantage of it too. All right, um, so with that said, let's uh, turn our attention over to this language. So, there's one weakness, one big weakness I think about JavaScript is that I have yet to find sort of a really impressive set of documentation for it. So PHP.net, frankly, I think is wonderful. And if you've not been using it all that much for learning PHP and for tackling Project 2, start doing so more because it's a fairly good, I mean, it's one of the best documentations for a language that I've seen largely because they include actual examples and even later discussion where people contribute little tidbits and tricks. So JavaScript doesn't quite have that. So these are some decent references. Um, you'll find that some of the major browsers have kind of put their own spins on the language, so it's kind of hard sometimes to find the uh, authoritative voice. Um, the W3C, or Mo the, sorry, the Mozilla folks have kind of you know, put a stake in the ground and said this is JavaScript, and there's various versions of it and so forth. But for the most part, you don't tri tend to trip over uh, JavaScript differences across browsers, except when it comes to Ajax, and we'll see that in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's manageable, but annoying nonetheless. So these are some recommended resources, if you will. Okay, so I can hear the voice going a little bit already. So questions? 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 No? Okay. So. You answered my question a second ago. Who's responsible for JavaScript? Oh, okay. Well, there you go. And actually, let me, let me make one mention of something. So, Java is not JavaScript, and JavaScript is not Java. So, rumor has it the name JavaScript was chosen, though, a few years ago to kind of ride the coattails of this other popular language, Java, or so goes the story, maybe the Wikipedia article, wherever I pick that up. It's a source of stupid confusion, but they are very much different. There is no fundamental relationship other than the names sound very similar. So, such is the language we have. So, JavaScript is an interpreted language, and by this, it's not interpreted server-side like PHP. It's going to be interpreted client-side by the browser itself. So servers right now, at least as we understand them, send to the browser uh, XHTML, CSS, GIFs, and JPEGs, and, and Flash files, and movies, and JavaScript. So JavaScript can be embedded in a page itself. 
So we've got div tags, uh, paragraph tags. There's also a script tag. So a script tag looks a little something like this. You can put this either in the head of a document or in the body of a document. And depending on where it is, it will execute at that moment in time when the web page is parsed by the browser top to bottom, left to right. So there's some curiosities here, though. Um, slash slash denotes a comment in JavaScript. Uh, PHP, you can use this as well. But what's with the C data here? We talked about this, I think, briefly in the past. What's with the open bracket, bang, uh, bracket, C data, bracket, and the opposite? Uh, sorry? Yeah, so it's character data. And this is in contrast to something called PC data, parsed character data. So what was character data? And this first came up in our discussion of XML, and it's actually related. Yeah. So it's a stream of text. In other words, this cryptic sequence of characters is a directive to the browser saying, here comes some data you should not try to parse. And by parse, we mean don't look for special characters like ampersands. Don't look for special characters like open brackets. Just blindly suck in this text and keep doing so until you reach the closed tag, uh, bracket, bracket, angled bracket. So this is to avoid the browser confusing JavaScript code with, say, XHTML code. So it will still get executed. This does not mean ignore everything in here, but it means ignore it as XHTML, because it's presumably not. And this will allow me to write JavaScript expressions like if x is less than 0, then dot, dot, dot. Why is this something that I probably don't want to be parsed by the XHTML engine in the browser? You're smiling. You must know. Yeah. So there's this less than sign, which is a special symbol in XHTML. Now, a very smart parser could look at this and, be, and realize, well, my god, I mean, there's a space. There's a zero. This is definitely not a tag. There's no confusion. But this is such as the spec. It should be a, this is a special character. should not appear anywhere in the document. And the fact that the browser generally assumes that this marks the start of the tag is actually good for performance, because it doesn't have to analyze the rest of the line to figure out the context. So the C data section is very good practice. It's not strictly necessary. If you start nosing about other website, popular websites' uh, source code, you'll find that this stuff is often omitted. But in the interest of best practice and making your own code as robust as possible, so easy to do, even if it takes you a little while to remember the cryptic sequence of symbols, um, it's a good thing. Yeah? Can you use that within your XHTML? You can. So this is out of context, but imagine this is in your body tag somewhere or even in your head tag. Right, because like I was noticing that my, um, my last project that I had the URL that had ampersands and everything was invalidated. Exactly. The right solution there, if you have ampersands in your URLs, which we very commonly do on the course's own website, unlike the lectures page, it, this is a bit of a nuisance, but such is, such is reality. If you have got an ampersand in a URL, you actually can change it to an HTML, XHTML entity like that. Um, it looks stupid in source code, but the browser renders that as just a actual ampersand. So that's the right solution. There's really no need to put URLs in C data sections. Other questions? Yeah. Well, so that's the thing. It's not necessary. And we've. And even in their example, I'm sure it was less than the ever... So we've been very spoiled, we as a community, by the browser vendors who have let us for 15 years be very lax when it comes to things like this. And HTML certainly didn't help because it itself was so lax when it came to rules. So in reality, you can probably nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100 get away with this. But frankly, if you actually you know, are anal enough like me to actually be very sensitive to these issues, to realize that you might not have tripped over something, but there's a Linux community out there that doesn't use, say, the latest and greatest and popular consumer browsers that might actually care about validity of code, um, it comes at relatively low cost. So in other words, for other people, your code might, in fact, be breaking. Because if you're not actually testing it on all possible browsers. So in the interest of actually adhering to standards and web standards, if you go with something like this and the browser is XHTML compliant, there should be no problems by definition of the spec. If you don't comply with rules like this, you know, you're rolling the dice, but odds are it's going to come up in your favor. But it's still a risk and perhaps an unnecessary risk. Right? There's even, I mean, there's small things that are uh, tolerable. But we'll see today that you can create arrays in um, 
in JavaScript, and you can create objects in JavaScript. And one an example of an array in JavaScript might be this. Uh, I can do var, and we'll come back to this. Var x gets open bracket, which denotes an array in JavaScript. And I can do something like uh, foo, quote, bar. And then, you know, I let's just suppose I dynamically generated this array with some PHP code. Um, I decide, just because I'm, you know, it's always annoying to get rid of like the last piece of syntax sometimes or put an and between two words. So just assume that programmatically it's a lot easier for me to leave a trailing comma there. You know, there are browsers that will completely support this. It's perfectly fine, i.e. will almost always choke on something like this. And so just things like this. You have these stupid corner cases that if you actually adhere to the proper syntax, you'll just save yourself time later, later on. So, um, so with that said, um, there's another, well, just FYI, because you'll see different things, you can also specify uh, script tags like this if you actually care about the version of JavaScript you're running. If you're writing code that's JavaScript version dependent, it's probably not very portable, in which case you probably shouldn't be doing this unless you have a very isolated environment where you can sort of demand of your staff that they all use some certain browser. So the first version, this, with the MIME type, is by far the more common. So this is the other more common approach, and this is um, just a different approach. You can actually write all of your JavaScript code not in your web web page itself, but in a separate file, just like you can CSS, uh, and, um, and just like you can CSS files. So this is the syntax here. Notice if I want to be XHTML compliant, I open the tag and I close this tag. And this is one of these sort of unfortunate societal issues whereby many browsers do not like script something something and then close it as an empty element, like we do with link elements for CSS or HR or BR. So frankly, these are just these stupid things like you know, a lot of browsers choke on this, which is why this is the better convention when it comes to script tags. Don't put anything between the tags, but do put an explicit close tag like this. So there's a few advantages of this. Why, even though we haven't, many of you haven't seen JavaScript before, just assume it's some language and it's going to let us do some interesting things like validate form data and grab more tiles from Google Maps, things like this. Why do you think it might be a good thing to put this code in a separate file and include a tag like this, a la CSS, as opposed to putting it in the web page itself and encasing it with tags like this? Just intuitively. Perfect. So if multiple pages want to use the same code, this, is a, this latter way is a much better way of making it available to all of them without resorting to copy-paste. Um, push And let's go a little deeper here. Why is that also advantageous? You avoid copy-paste, but also... Good. So you update it one place, just like CSS, and it kind of propagates automatically everywhere else. Other thoughts? Yeah? Uh, keeps your code proprietary. Keeps, oh, good one. So it keeps your code proprietary. So Actually, no, not really at all. So this is one of the interesting risks or features of JavaScript is that it is very much executed client side, and there's no way of pre-compiling it into, say, binary zeros and ones, which is much harder for a human to sort of reverse engineer. So when it comes to intellectual property and writing JavaScript code, you can't really protect yourself. You can put it in a separate file, but frankly, I could just copy and paste the URL from that tag into my browser and get the contents. So when it comes time to talk about, um, actually later today, I'll point you in the direction of a couple of programs that are JavaScript compressors or obfuscators. What does it mean to obfuscate code, if, for those familiar? Yeah, so you, you garble up the code in a way that it's still readable by a machine. It's still parsable, it's still syntactically valid, but to a human it's a lot harder to understand. So for instance, you take, you've been taught for years or have learned uh, at work, you know, always choose good variable names so that it's readable and all of this. Always comment your code. Well, machines don't need comments, so a compressor or an obfuscator will throw away all comments. It will change your very useful names like size and length and very descriptive names to X and Y and Z, doing the opposite of what everyone's ever been taught. But the, the machine doesn't care. Humans do care. But by, and it will eliminate all unnecessary white space. So the end result, so let's actually see if we can mimic this. Let me go to, um, I'll go to facebook.com, because I know it has JavaScript. Let me go into its source code here and look in, I'm going to search for a script tag. So they have a little bit of JavaScript sort of code in their page itself, another in their page itself for whatever reason. So this is interesting. Um, this is the URL of some JavaScript code in Facebook, and there it is. 
So they're, it's not that their developers are this bad when it comes to like design and style. This is obfuscated code. They wrote code probably in a separate file. It's pretty clean, well commented, good variable names. They ran it through a program for two reasons. One, to just raise the bar, to make it harder for adversaries to copy their code, to mimic or recreate their site, but also for performance, especially Facebook, Google, these very popular websites, all of those bytes add up. And hitting the enter key, adding superfluous white space comments, you're just literally wasting money because someone has to pay for that bandwidth. So it has two upsides. So realize that you could send to the client stuff like this. So this is actually a uh, common misconception, especially like among management types who just want, you know, protect our intellectual property, let's, you know, uh, uh, encrypt our JavaScript code and all of this. It only raises the bar. So an astute programmer, someone who's savvy, can certainly figure out exactly what this does. But the, the tale I always tell is that, well, if you have an adversary who's smart and adept enough to figure out what your code is doing, odds are he or she could just write this from scratch based on the functionality and not waste time doing this. So that's all you're doing. You're raising the bar. Fundamentally, there is no way of hiding your XHTML from people or your JavaScript from people. It can always be reverse engineered. PHP, by contrast, can be kept protected because it's kept server side. So this is, it's actually kind of neat to see you know, this is actually JavaScript code, complete mess, um, and actually quite large. I can only imagine, my god, how much code Facebook downloads. Actually, as an aside, let me pull up, um, we'll go to facebook.com again, and let me pull up one thing here. Let me pull up Firebug in the corner. I'm using, again, Firefox, big fan for this stuff. It has this net tab if you've never used it. When you actually have working products and working projects, if you want to get a sense of your website's performance, especially if it really matters to one's superiors or to customers and such, I'm going to go ahead and reload this whole page. And now notice in the bottom, I get kind of a benchmark of all the stuff that uh, Facebook just downloaded to my site. And I think we did this once before, but just to give you a sense of what's coming down the wire now, we have uh, 10 kilobytes of just content coming from the web page itself. That took uh, 341 milliseconds. We have 9 kilobytes of JavaScript in this .js file named rather cryptically. And so what you get in the end is it took about 730 milliseconds to download Facebook.com. Humans can typically tolerate two, mil uh, two seconds or less when it comes to actually having a pleasurable experience. So if your website's taking more than two seconds to load a page, there's definitely opportunities for refinement, which actually allows us to come full circle here. So why factor out code like this? Caching is one of the biggest things, because the browsers typically, unless you're sending out non-caching headers, will cache content like this. So yeah, I just downloaded nine kilobytes of JavaScript from Facebook. Odds are they don't change it that often. That's kind of a lie, because they roll out like new code every Tuesday. But, um, this lends itself to saving them money and saving your browser and especially your limited mobile devices bandwidth and therefore time. But there is a gotcha. With caching comes what downside? Yeah, so this is kind of a two-edged sword. So caching is wonderful if you get the code right and you have no intention to, of changing it uh, terribly often. But if you're telling the client to cache the code in perpetuity for a day, for a week, it makes it a lot harder to roll out bug fixes or new features. So what you'll often find, let me see if on the fly we can see such in Facebook, what you'll often find people doing to discourage caching in browsers is it looks like Facebook has taken a relatively new approach here. So I suspect, and I'm only guessing, that one of the reasons they have such cryptic file names here is to actually mitigate the effects of caching because they're not just calling it scripts.js, they're calling it something somewhat nonsensical, probably so that they're getting essentially a random string. So it might be the case, don't know for sure, that Facebook is actually forcing our browsers to download updates way more often than a typical site. So I bring this up partly for um, academic purposes here. If you're developing your sites, especially if you're working late into the night, it's very easy to get completely frustrated by some bug you could have sworn you fixed, but it's just because some, the old version of your code is stuck in the browser's cache. So you'll often want to make your PHP files, at least for development purposes, not cache at all, certainly during development, and you can do this via a couple of tricks that many of you have used already. If I go to PHP's, uh, let's do actually PHP header, and let me do a quick search on this page. Caching directives, example two. Um, this is, these are two of the most popular ways in PHP to uh, tell the browser, do not cache 
this PHP file. JavaScript is trickier, though. You can send the same HTTP headers, but again, pursuant to this problem of browsers behaving differently, there's some browsers, and I think it's IE, that if you tell it not to cache a CSS file or not cache a JavaScript file, might not be true in IE8, but it was true in IE6 and maybe 7, it just wouldn't use that CSS file or JavaScript file at all. If you said don't cache it, it essentially, for whatever reason, equated to don't even know that it exists. So you would get weird bugs there too. So one of the common ways people will mitigate this, and Facebook used to do this the last time I looked at their source code, they'll have a file like scripts.js, but then they'll do question mark one, two, three, four, five, where this is just a timestamp or something like that that changes um, either every time you visit the page or every once in a while so that the browser realizes, oh, new URL, let me refetch this page. So again, just a lot of sort of real world tidbits here that can both avoid bugs and also you know, maybe improve or uh, hurt your performance. All right, so let's actually look at some actual code and look at some problems if JavaScript's not in place. So the latter first, here is a very small snippet of JavaScript code. It's just going to print hello world. So document, you can think of as a global variable accessible any, uh, to any JavaScript uh, function or program running inside of your browser. Document refers to the current web page. Document.write, excuse me, is a function that you get for free. It comes with the browser, and it will simply take an argument and put it at that location in the page. So if I embed that whole snippet of JavaScript code in my body, I will very simply get a web page that says, hello world. It's as simple as that. Now, that's no gain from just literally typing hello world in my body but at least it will, um, it at least demonstrates a very simple use case. So let's try this. Let me go ahead and just SSH to an account here. Let me go ahead, I'll go into CS75. And let me then proceed to, all right, public. Uh, let's go into lectures, seven source. OK, so I'm going to go ahead, and we've got a few prefabbed examples, but this one I'll do on the fly. I'm going to do, in, uh, let's do um, uh, javascript.html. Actually, let me do one thing, since all these years later, I still never remember any of these things. So form1.html, javascript.html. This is how I start most every web page I make. Take my most recent project and copy it. So let's go clean this up. OK, and we'll get this, this. OK, so now I'm going to close my body. I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to close my HTML. And in here, I'm just going to do, let's see, script type equals text slash JavaScript. I'll close the script tag. It took me a while to remember these attributes, but now I know it's da 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 and then da 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 all right, so now I have a placeholder for some JavaScript. Um, in terms of style, some people indent two places, some people indent four places, just be consistent. Um, and now I'm going to do document.write, hello world. You're about to be very underwhelmed, but at least we have something working. Close quote, semicolon. OK, so JavaScript.html. So let me go to CS75.net, uh, lecture 7 source, and go to JavaScript.html. OK, voila, as promised. Completely underwhelming. But what's interesting is if I view the DOM here, by viewing my, sorry, if I view my source code, I see the raw source. So again, testament to the fact that you are sending your intellectual property to the browser. There it is, even though it's actually executing server uh, client side, and I'm actually seeing the results on the page. Let me go ahead and open Firebug here and go to my HTML tag open my body tag, what you'll see here too is the same thing within Firebug. So an interesting test is this. So various browsers have some developing tools or de debugging tools. Um, this doesn't come by default. If you Google Safari developer menu, you can run a little command line to enable this thing, the develop menu. It's very useful. It's built in. The Apple just hides it. But what I actually kind of find kind of fun these days is to pull up my favorite websites with JavaScript disabled just to see what actually breaks. Um, this is sort of a, let's see actually, I'm guessing Facebook's homepage works just fine. Oh, but they do realize it. So that's kind of interesting. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, if it is the case, let me see, apple.com. Yeah, there's kind of works. There's parts of apple.com that even break. And is there one that, oh, let's see. Ooh, I don't think I've ever done this. Maps.google.com. All right, one Oxford Street is Harvard Science Center, 02138. Enter. 
wow, I don't think you've ever seen Google Maps like this. This, this is sort of, see, no, no more clicking and dragging. It doesn't go anywhere. Wow, that's so retro. Um, <laughs> sort of map quest from yesteryear. Anyhow, um, it's actually an interesting topic, though, disabling JavaScript, because for many years, and still, there's this sort of concern with, do you want to expect your users to have certain features? Um, and in this room here, those of you who have been programming web stuff for, before, do you, care, uh, do you support users who don't have JavaScript disabled, uh, who don't have it enabled? Or do you just kind of say, ugh, turn on JavaScript? Anyone have a strong opinion either way? Interesting. Okay. <laughs> so, not, so there are ways to show them error messages, but okay. <laughs> to get that far. Okay. So just to recap for the camera, uh, for public-facing websites, your entity at least um, uh, doesn't require JavaScript, doesn't use JavaScript, but for in more internal stuff, you do. Other thoughts on the matter? It's kind of an interesting question. And the answer, I, I feel, kind of changes over time. Because if you, also as an at-home exercise, if you look at almost any website you visit today, odds are it's using JavaScript. And some non-trivial percentage of those websites are probably relying on JavaScript to do a whole lot, whether it's to embed videos, whether it's to animate certain menus. Facebook has become very JavaScript heavy. And even the course's own website uses JavaScript in places. So I would say these days, if you, are, if you have users who are among the paranoid who are turning JavaScript off, I mean, that's a community that personally I think that it's not clear to me you need to worry so much about those folks. So JavaScript certainly got a bad rap early on, various security implications potentially. But for the most part, JavaScript is very much a sandbox language. You cannot open disks. Uh, you cannot open files locally and start writing things to the user's hard drive, cookies aside. You can't read their files. You can't send emails unbeknownst to them um, via their computer. Now, you can if there are bugs in the browsers or if there are problems with the implementation. But in theory, JavaScript itself can do very little. In fact, for the next project, you yourselves will probably trip over some of the security mechanisms that are in place. And as a result, we'll have to use a PHP proxy, a script you write server side, just so that you can have your website talk to Google News. Because you'll find that they can't talk directly because of this thing called same origin policy. So that's one consideration. And even I, at least professionally, am kind of at the point where if you're not running JavaScript, like ugh, it's really not worth our time. Or conversely, it's it takes us way too much time to re-implement our website in a way that is purely uh, non-JavaScript accessible. So case in point, I mean, this is probably essentially a different code branch that implements this version of Google Maps. It's two products separately. And so that's the catch. Is it really worth 50% more of your time to cater to 1% of the audience? Now with that said, before the iPhone came around, most mobile phones did not really support JavaScript, certainly not very well. My BlackBerry kind of had support for it, but it was very poor. So there are more compelling reasons, like devices that simply don't have support for it. So if, for the most part, you know, I as a user accepted that my BlackBerry couldn't visit like five out of 10 sites or even more than that. This thing is great. There's not a website I can't visit with this thing, but this is because it's an actual browser with actual JavaScript support. So I offer this just for consideration, because these are certainly design decisions one needs to make, certainly in the real world. Now, for those of you who want to, um, tolerate users with no JavaScript, there is a built-in mechanism. It's not often debuted, but it's probably what Facebook is using. If you have a script tag and JavaScript's disabled, the browser will essentially say, I don't know what this is. I'm just going to ignore it. They should understand no script, because even if they don't, that content, just by nature of tags, will get dumped to the screen. And it will say, goodbye, world, All right, so our little cutesy response. Does JavaScript have any accessibility in terms of Yeah. It does. So actually, I, that's really the third concern, too. So websites that are very JavaScript laden might actually interfere with screen readers, much as tables can, for instance, get in the way of uh, some, of those uh, some of those tools. 
So it's definitely a concern. And actually, one of the reasons that we for the courses website, and even me personally, tend to use and preach, frankly, YUI, is because of the half a dozen or dozen very popular JavaScript libraries out there today that have widgets for calendars and for WYSIWYG editors in JavaScript. Very few of those entities actually have given much thought to Section 508 concerns, which means accessibility. Um, for folks who have various disabilities and need sort of uh, certain support in the browser to actually be able to interface with it. So Yahoo, for instance, has been very sensitive to those issues. So they are far more compliant and friendly even for their JavaScript libraries. So that alone, at least in a university environment, was important for us for some of these projects. So it's a good concern too. Okay. All right, so we kind of have teased you thus far. What is JavaScript itself? Well, fortunately, we don't need to spend all that much time on the syntax, truth be told, because it's very similar to languages you've seen before, one of them being PHP. So no dollar signs before variables, but for the most part, we have pretty much the same kinds of constructs. Here's a non-exhaustive laundry list of you know, the most common constructs you would probably use when writing some JavaScript code. Familiar should be some loops here, ifs and elses. Uh, it, is, it does support exception handling, so try and throw and catch if you're familiar with those techniques, and a bunch of other options as well. So before forging ahead with um, some of the fancier features, why don't we actually solve a real problem? So let me go to our uh, source code here. I'm going to continue using Firefox, and I'm going to go to Form 1. So a very simple idea is that of form validation. So thus far, for your projects, you've probably been validating data server-side with PHP. And that's a very good thing, and it's a good practice to continue. But there's a downside of validating your data server-side, at least from the user's perspective. Like, why is it annoying to have to rely on the server for form validation, checking that your input is valid? What's that? Right, you don't know there's an error until after you filled out the whole form or part thereof, click submit, you reach the next page, and the most annoying of websites are the ones that say, you know, uh, you've uh, failed to provide a valid email address, click back in your browser to go back. Because some percentage of the time, what happens when you click back? The whole form disappears, often because they've told that page not to cache itself. So the, with the uh, non-caching directive comes a blowing away of the input you provided. There is nothing more infuriating than like a long form you've just filled out when something like that happens. So there's ways to mitigate this. So one, you can actually provide the user with a, a, your own version of the back button, say click here to go back. And what that really is, is a button that sent, generates a new page pre-populating the form using PHP or whatever language uh, so that the user's fields are still there. So that's one approach. But what's arguably a, a more user-friendly approach to form validation than that page one leads to page two with the errors? Stay on page one. So maybe forget JavaScript, but maybe you click submit. What's very common is you'll see yourself at the same page, but all of a sudden you'll get a banner at the top that says, please correct the following errors. Or you'll, the fields will become red or yellow, and it will say, fix this. And you'll get little uh, icons that say, fix this for whatever reason. So um, much more intuitive and just much more immediate. So JavaScript kind of takes this to the next level, because you actually don't have to talk to the server if you can do some of the validation client side. So if you're just checking for a valid email address and you're just checking for password one equaling password two, all of this can be done in very simple logic on the client side. So we can, and we will in just a second, implement the same validation using JavaScript. So let's do that. So here's a form. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and type in mailin at post.harvard.edu, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and I'm gonna check this little box. Now before I click submit, let's actually see what's underneath the hood here. So I'm gonna use Firebug, because it keeps the code nice and pretty. Here's the form. To what file is this gonna submit? Okay, so process.php. So let's do a quick, quick check at that file. What are we going to expect here? So process.php. No, I really didn't put much effort into this. So it's not even a valid web page. It's really just for debugging, because we're going to answer a couple of questions here. Like one, how is data sent from client to server? Just a quick refresh there. But two, we just want to see the results, because then we're going to start to tr ideally avoid this file altogether by doing client-side validation. But this form apparently has no JavaScript whatsoever. I see no script tag anywhere, and that's intentional. Because when I submit this form here, I want to just sail right through and get to the end result. 
So process.php, I just whipped up, just to print recursively, the dollar sign underscore uh, get array or request array, the super global, just to see what's going on inside. So the quick refresher here is um, what method did I use to actually submit this data according to the DOM here? So it is get, right? You can see it there in quote unquote get. And you can also see it by way of the URL I ended up, which if you look at the very top of the screen, got long quickly because we have process.php, question mark, parameter equals value, parameter equals value, parameter equals value, separated by ampersands. So let's now see if we can't mess with this. You know what? I don't feel like providing my password this time. So submit. Hmm. OK, so now nothing went through. Be nice to catch this in advance so that the user doesn't have to actually go back. So let's see if we can't take things up a notch to form two. So in form two, I'm going to do, you know, I'm completely lazy. I, you don't need this information. Submit. OK, so now we have a little pop-up. This will look a little different in different browsers, which itself is arguably a disadvantage. Each vendor decided to present this, picture, this window in a different way. But it's quick, it's dirty, it's useful, it's robust. So frankly, even I've started using these once in a while. Wouldn't I just need a quick prompt? Even Google, frankly, in some of their products, uses these little pop-ups. And I think Calendar, Google Docs, not all the time, but sometimes. Doesn't make it right, but means at least other people are doing it. So, and if Google can do it, hey. All right, so what is the saying? You must provide an email address. So somehow I detected that. And let's, let's notice here, I'm still on the same page, form2.html. In fact, let's confirm. Let me pull up live HTTP headers so I can sniff this submission. Let me click Submit again. Nothing happened. So there's also another advantage of JavaScript validation. So what's another upside here, apparently? Besides just the user's experience, what have I also done for my, my own sake? So less traffic, right? Fewer bytes, less bandwidth, less load on my server. And if you assume that, you know, let's just say 50% of users you know, screw up their form submissions, I mean, you're already reducing by a significant percentage the number of hits on your web server, because you're going to force the user to not even let their browser give you anything until it's ready to go. So how is this working? Well, let's take a look. This is, um, pro, uh, this is form2.html. You have printouts of this. Let me go ahead and zoom in a bit. And let's fast forward just to the bottom. So we've seen this. This is the body of my XHTML. I'll zoom in, but there's really nothing juicy here. This is all kind of old hat now. So action is process PHP, method is get. But notice this. I gave my form a name this time. Called it registration. Eh, it's a registration form. I called it registration. And then I have this. So it turns out that XHTML thanks to JavaScript, has a bunch of event handlers that you can register. So an event handler, or in this case, an attribute, the name says it all, on submit. So this, you can read this literally. What should you do on submission of this form? You should execute the code within quotes. JavaScript is disabled, nothing happens. But if JavaScript is enabled, what happens? The validate function is called, and the return value of it is returned to the browser. So the goal here is to write a function called validate that returns true if everything's perfect, and therefore the form submission should be allowed to happen, and the server gets hit. But my function validate is going to return false, and in turn, that value is going to get returned to the browser if I want to short circuit the form submission and have nothing happen, just like we saw now. So apparently, when I fill out nothing, my function validate is returning false. Let's confirm as much. So I'm going to scroll back up, and here's the promised syntax. I've got a typical web page. I've got an XHTML doc type. I've got my tags. I've got my head element. So because I wanted to write a function, it makes sense for me to define it in the head of the page so that I know once I reach the body, the function has been defined. Because for the most part, web pages are parsed top to bottom. So if you define a function up here, it will be ready, ready to be called down here. So when your pages get fancier, even if, uh, for project two, or rather three, or the final project, or even in life after, you actually have to start to get very, be very sensitive to the moment in time at which things are loaded into memory. So quick tangent, if you start to have, in very sophisticated websites, lots of script tags, which, in, which inside of them have bunches of functions, and you want one function to call another function, 
it is possible, because of multi-threading, that not all functions will be ready to be called. It's possible that your DOM, the web page itself, might not have been finished loading into memory. So if you try to manipulate a form field, but that form field hasn't been loaded into RAM, into the tree structure, you'll get a JavaScript error. So you essentially have race conditions, which are the result of multi-threading. So there are ways to avoid this, and we'll see. And libraries like YUI will help mitigate this. But once your code starts getting fancier, you start to get these corner cases where debuggers are helpful, an understanding of the situation helps, um, and also libraries, which mitigate these uh, threading issues. But we're pretty simple here. We're not going to trip over that for this example. So here we go. I have a function called validate. The syntax is to literally say function, like in PHP, then validate, then it's arguments, if any. And now, it's a little verbose, but gets the job done. Here's that global variable, global object, really, called document. It has a property built in called forms. Uh, forms is an object, too. And it contains inside of it all of the forms in my web page. I only have one, but I can reference it by way of its name. So the reason I gave my form element a name is so that I can go document.forms.registration. So you can actually, if you flip this long string like this, it's like a tree. So the document is the whole thing. Then I'm diving down deeper into all of the forms. Then I'm diving down e deeper into a specific form called registration. What field am I getting from that form, apparently? Email. And email itself is actually an object, an input element is an object in memory, and it has a value. So I do email.value. I don't just do .email. So what I'm saying here is actually pretty readable, even if you've never once before seen JavaScript. If that value equals equals nothing, what do I do? I call this alert function, which you get for free with JavaScript. It's built in. Triggers a little pop-up with an OK button or the equivalent, and it prints out that phrase there. And then I forcibly return false to tell the browser, uh-uh, don't let the form submission through. A common mistake, FYI, is if I had done something like this, very easy to do, and forgotten this, the form submission would go through no matter what you return. So beware. Yeah? The, the name should function like an ID should be unique. Uh, the function name should be unique, yes. So you can't make your own alert function, for instance, um, because it would conflict with the existing one in memory. Good question. Yeah? It is, and it, it looks a little messy, to be honest, to me. Um, so it's necessary because, by definition of the event handler on submit, it will return what you tell it to return. So if you tell it to return nothing, it will assume the truth value of true. And it, will, it means the browser will submit successfully to the server. If, though, you have that expression return false, it will short circuit the form submission. So in short, that's just the way it is. There are different ways to register this event handler. This is the easy way. We'll see over time more sophisticated ways that don't look quite as ugly or, or hackish. But this is the right way for here. So just by having the word return there in quotes, it will return the HTML as a value. Think of it as the browser is going to realize, oh, on submit is a event handler. The value of its attribute I know to be JavaScript code. I am going to evaluate this JavaScript code and then do something with its return value. What should I do? By definition of onSubmit, if the return value is true, I should submit the form. If it's false, I should not. So it's really by definition of the handler here. So that oh, uh, let, me, let me go here first. Absolutely. You can have multiple forms in a page, which is why I consciously named it so I could identify it uniquely. And had I not named it, I could, this could still work had I not named it here. So notice I have name equals registration. If I forgot to do that or just felt like it's complicating things unnecessarily, forms is actually an object. But you can treat it as an array for reasons we'll, we'll hint at in a bit. So I could say the zeroth form is the one I want. The danger here, frankly, is that if later in life you add another form to the page, now you're going to get an ambiguity. So in general, in general naming the forms is probably the best long-term approach. Uh, here. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, um, if we go back to the HTML. Sure. Correct. So I'm propagating the return value of the validate function by saying return validate. 
So you can think of the browser as the caller. When the browser realizes, oh, here's a string of JavaScript, let me execute this, it behaves as a result based on the return value of that function. I'm going to have to move myself to wired internet because my connection is dying here. Uh, yes, here, and then there, then there. Ah, good question, actually. Um, let me, let's see if my connection's cooperating here. The question is, is it better to take this approach, which I just uh, did. Let me save my changes here. Is it better to take, sorry, let me pause for a moment and kill my wireless, because otherwise this will take us twice as long. OK, let's try that. Sorry, slight delay. OK, Elixir 7 source. Zoom in, form two. So the question is, is it better to uh, name your form or to use document? Uh, there's another function in JavaScript. Let me give a quick teaser, but we'll come back to it because it will be more useful later. I could also take this approach. So think of this as an alternative, but again, we'll revisit this idea. Names are OK. IDs in general are better because they, so long as you keep them unique, which they should be by definition of ID, and I say registration, if I do this, what this allows me to use is a special function that comes with JavaScript, and we'll use it even more for Ajax, whereby I can say if document.getElementById, you got to be sensitive to the capitalization in JavaScript. Another common bug is to miss a capital letter or the like. You could do this, registration, and this works across browsers, and you know you're getting the element you care about if you've defined the ID appropriately. So then I could say value equals this. So this is, say, version 3 of the code. But again, we'll come back to this. Um, I would say that um, I tend to use this approach, especially because with various JavaScript libraries, jQuery is one of the most popular ones. There's shorthand notation to do tricks like this, which really make your code more concise. Uh, I think I promised over here first. Uh, which, which is what built into the browser? The JavaScript APIs. Which it's built into the browser. So when you download a browser, if it supports JavaScript, it supports some version, whether it's 1.3 or 1.4, 1.5. For the most part, you don't, shouldn't have to care about the versions these days, but it comes with the browser. So any modern browser comes with JavaScript to support. Mobile phone browsers, maybe not so much. So that's where it becomes a little, you have to be a little more mindful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. And so to summarize, for those unfamiliar, there's XHTML exists in a couple of flavors, strict and transitional. Transitional is a little looser. It lets you use more tags and more attributes than you can in strict. Personally, I almost always use transitional, just so I don't trip over stuff like that. Um, even these days, but so realize if you get validity errors because of that, you'll run into some gotchas now that we're introducing yet more syntax. Yeah. Uh, this should work in, uh, let's say, I have no Chrome on. OK, so I'll double check. I'm almost positive, though, it does work in Chrome, in which case it was probably something else. But I'm happy to verify once I'm back in a PC. OK, so let's just glance at the, other, the rest of the code here. It's all fairly similar. So let's take a look. Apparently, with this next block of code, I'm going to check if the password1 value is blank. So I had four form fields, email, password1, password2, and um, agreement which was my checkbox. So I'm checking, does the password one value equal blank? If so, I'm going to yell at the user with this message. You must provide a password. Uh, this one, it's wrapping long because my font is big. But it says, if document.forms.registration.password1.value does not equal uh, password two's value, I'm going to yell at the user also. And as an aside, for those following along at home, I'm realizing the, the red text really stinks on this screen. So I'll see if I can adjust ASAP. Um, uh, finally, if the user did not check the box, I'm going to yell at them for not checking the box. How do I do that? Well, checkbox doesn't have a value. It has a property checked, 
which is either true or false. So in this case, I'm just checking implicitly if it's not true, then I need to yell at the user. So to be clear, I can, as the user, disable all of these protections simply by disabling JavaScript in any number of ways, by using a browser that's so old that doesn't support it, or by using a browser that lets me disable it. So that then begs the question, is it really worth this exercise? Because writing this code now, I just had to write a bunch of lines of code, and yet it's so easily circumvented. So where's the line here? Like, is it worthwhile doing this? OK, you, you say yes, why? So for server traffic, right, 99% of people are not going to disable JavaScript, and most of them probably don't even know how. And you know, unless you install some modification, sometimes you can't disable it, at least not very easily. So that's certainly reasonable. Take the load off the server. Yeah? So better to handle it this way, and why? More intuitive, more immediate feedback. And frankly, I've been traveling enough in various hotels where like, the internet never works well in hotels. So we even, even in this day and age with you know, high-speed internet at home, there's a lot of context, Starbucks even, where the internet connections are not so hot. And so going to another page, then going back, it's just a waste of time, not to mention bandwidth and server resources. But this does then beg one, uh, one consideration. Can you use this instead of server-side validation? So clearly not, or at least if not clear, it should be clearly not, because it's so easily circumvented, at least by the bad guys, by an adversary who knows to go to disable JavaScript in the menu, or who can fake HTTP calls and just send any traffic you want, to keep your data, in, um, to maintain the integrity of your data server side, you absolutely always want to do server side validation. So this week and next is not all about cutting corners on the server side. These are really icing on the cake or enhancements to a site that should already have rigorous error checking server side. Um, frankly, it's unfortunate. It's a bit of a nuisance. But you'll find um, beyond this course, there are various frameworks and APIs that are actually making this stuff easier. Uh, whereby you can use a, an API that you can say, a, a framework of sorts, whether it's PHP or some other language, where you say, you know, this form should be, um, uh, this form should be text, this form should be an email, this form field should be numeric. And what some of these frameworks will actually do is generate not only the server-side validation logic for you, it will also send to the browser when the user requests that dynamically generated page, JavaScript that also does the error checking client side. CodeIgniter is a very um, popular and relatively simple PHP framework. Some of you might want to check out for your final projects. And in fact, if you're kind of hurting for ideas for the final project, realize that a very worthy endeavor would be go beyond the scope of the course, pick up some new tool or some new framework that you'd really like to learn for fun or for work, and then focus on some of the same building blocks from the course, but using some templating library or some framework. And that's one of, frankly, I looked at a bunch. Cake, PH, uh, Cake PHP is very popular. Frankly, the learning curve was way too high for my taste. It was like learning a whole new environment just to simplify my PHP life, which is already pretty simple. Um, but CodeIgniter, I think, is very accessible if you just want to learn a PHP framework. All right, why don't we and my voice take a five minute break? All right, we are back. Uh, I think I have a little more in me. So I actually feel, lest you're worried that I'm just here spewing germs and stuff, I actually feel fine. It's just like laryngitis from uh, yesterday, I think. So uh, good to go. Um, so let's see if we can introduce a few more pieces of syntax and then also give a bit of teaser as to where we're going with, uh, with this new feature of JavaScript. So um, it's kind of annoying, I think, that the syntax we've been using thus far is so verbose. So just FYI, in case you see it, there's actually a neat keyword called with. So this is another implementation. This is form3.html. Notice I have a new implementation of the validate function. Minor difference. I start the whole function with with and then a parenthetical expression. And what I've done is essentially change the scope for all of the uh, relative variables inside of there. So essentially, document.forms.registration is now going to be magically prepended to all of the expressions I later put. So it's the same code, but I've now made it a little more concise when it comes to this. So just FYI, this is a keyword that exists. But a little more interesting is this fourth flavor. So one of the interesting uh, things about 
my versions one through three, is that I kind of I hard coded into the validate function the path to the form that I want to validate. So this is fine for this version because I only have one form, but it'd be kind of nice to genericize my validation function so that anywhere on my website, if I want to validate a form that's got an email field and a uh, password field, I'd like to be able to reuse the code without hard coding the name of the registration form and use, or even using IDs. So there's this trick too. This is form4.html. Notice that what I've done here and it's wrapping just because of my big font. So let me put this on a new line. Notice that I have on submit again. And now I'm doing return validate this. So JavaScript has these things called references, like PHP does and uh, Java and other languages. This, in this context, refers to the element inside of which I currently am. So I'm currently inside of the form element, because this is in between its start tag. So when I say this, I mean this form element. So this approach has the effect of calling validate, passing in a reference, a pointer, what, an address of this form object. So now I've slightly genericized my approach because now I'm dynamically passing in the form that I want to validate. Now, I don't mean to overstate the utility of this because you'll see I'm still making assumptions as to the name of the fields in this form. So we could continue uh, to factor out some of these hard-coded values, but it's a step in the right direction. And the only difference is I define my validate function as taking a parameter, call it f for whatever, and now instead of doing document.forms.registration, document now I can say f.email, f.agreement, f.password1. So it's a little prettier, and it certainly cleans up my code a little more than the with keyboard did, which didn't really take us in a very interesting direction. So this, this keyword, we'll see again, especially with project three, where it's useful to be able to be self-referential in this way. So let's take a look at uh, version. Oh, and actually, why don't we demonstrate one of these? Because most of the validation is the same across all of them. So let me be difficult and not provide an email address again. I get this message. You must provide an email address. Let me go ahead and provide an email address and now no password. So the message changes. You must provide a password. Now, just to hammer home the point that there's not quite standardization in these pop-ups, let me load not Firefox but Safari. Let me go to the same URL and pull this up here and do submit. Whoops, wrong version. Oh, wait, this JavaScript is still disabled. There we go. So it looks a little different, right? And this is actually one of the reasons that alert, the function, is kind of frowned upon, um, at least by some, is it's not providing a very uniform user experience. Even the, um, the title bar of the menu is kind of stupid. The page at HTTP blah, 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 says, it's just not very elegant. So one of the reasons you actually don't see alerts being used all that commonly in production websites is one, it just doesn't look as nice and people want more control over the aesthetics. And there are ways to trigger using CSS and JavaScript sort of overlays for a website. Just to make this more real, let me pull up, um, let's say news.cs50.net, this toy site that I pulled up once before. So I am um, originally in this site, Let's see. Oh, yeah. If I click the mail link, so I actually use the alert function. I haven't had time uh, to actually implement the uh, email alert features for this website, so I'll get to it. Frankly, this took me like five seconds to implement this little pop-up, and very reasonable to me, frankly, especially given the frequency of this being actually clicked. But then I realized at some point, eh, I really should practice what I preach. So I changed a link like this, add public. Oh, I guess I didn't. OK, so I cut that corner, too. <laughs> Um, OK, I'll find a corner I didn't cut. So here's the explanation of what the website does. This RSS link, though, I had to beautify a bit. So now notice I just dimmed the background using some JavaScript tricks by overlaying essentially a semi-opaque uh, layer. I now have a box that looks like a dialog window. It even has this little checkbox, uh, X box to close it. But there's a couple of, whoops, um, oh, that's interesting. Interesting. OK, we'll take a look at that. Um, what's interesting about this is a couple of things. So one, now it's at least stylistically consistent with the rest of the site. So same font. I use the same colors, same uh, button controls and whatnot that I'm using elsewhere. 
Um, actually, that's a lie too, because of the library I'm using, the button looks a little different. But more compellingly, I wanted this to actually be an interactive dialogue. So what the point of this button is, is it's supposed to be allow, to allow users to generate sort of uh, customized RSS feeds. So I actually needed this window to be able to submit a form by way of clicking these buttons. So if I click Generate URL, I needed to get back a response and actually display it in a window, and I wanted it to shrink to actually fit to the size. Can't really do that as cleanly with JavaScript pop-ups. There are other types of JavaScript pop-ups, but once you start using them for input, I actually think it's fairly reasonable, because um, I think if Google has taught us nothing, it's that people generally seem to care more about functionality than necessarily about beauty and consistency. So take that for what it's worth. But for this behavior to be implemented, I actually had to use a, um, the Yahoo library. So Yahoo YUI has examples of dialogue windows. And again, one of the pointers I'll offer is this. If you search for YUI, you'll get this website here. They're in a transition period. Version 2 is the one that's very robust and popular. Uh, version 3 is out, but only 50% of it is actually out. Um, so right now, if you're new to this, I would stick with this version or any number of other libraries. But what's really neat in YUI is all of these widgets. Right? In one of the websites I've made, I needed a little pop-up calendar to select a date. I don't want to implement a pop-up calendar for all possible months of the century. Much nicer to just use a widget that someone else wrote and I'll stylize it with CSS. And that's what this does. So case in point, let me click on calendar. What's great about YUI 2 is that unlike some of the JavaScript libraries, their documentation is really stellar. They got examples, API documentation, forums. I mean, they really have done a solid job for what's essentially a, a volunteer thing for them, even though they use it themselves. If I click examples, let me just pick something like, um, let's do pop-up calendar basic. So just an example, if I click show calendar, this is what I mean by a little calendar pop-up. I don't want to implement this. Just It's too much effort. It's not interesting. And probably it's like constitutes 1% of a website you might actually be using a widget like this in. So again, one of the goals of these, uh, one of the uh, beauties of these libraries is that they just help you get real work done more quickly. So there's other stuff here, and I'll just mention one other, which is the one I'm using, which is called panel or dialogue. I forget which one offhand. But if I click through to panel and dialogue, I'll see things like this. Let's see, dialogue quick start example. You can actually pop something like this up and actually get a form that the user can fill out and you can interact it with with JavaScript. So again, there's other options. YUI is generally known to be a little more accessible, uh, Section 508 wise, but um, there's, there's options out there. And frankly, this is what's also making programming fun, at least for me of late, whereby if I want to make something with various pieces of user input, just so nice to be able to grab something off the shelf. And even if it's not as pretty as I would like, even if it takes some tinkering with CSS to make it look what I like, like what, the way I want it, I can always rip it out for version 2 and replace it with my own. But at least now I don't get hung up on stupid details like calendar selections. So it's an exciting time, I think. So with that said, the goal here was to take a step in a more um, flexible direction. That was version 4. Let's take a look at this fifth version. So there's one other feature of websites that's not uncommonly used. And that is, let me go back to this guy here. This is form 5. Notice there's something different about this web page. It's subtle, especially on this projector. Can you tell? Submit is disabled. So you may have noticed websites that actually don't let you click certain buttons, check certain boxes, or fill out certain fields because they're disabled. Well, how do you do that? Well, let's take a look at the XH. Uh, let's take a look at um, Firefox. Oh, another uh, Firebug. Another really cool thing about Firebug. Just again, preaching this free tool. Um, if I want to see. You know, how is this field implemented? You can highlight it. You can right click or control click and click inspect element once you have this installed. And it will dive right into that particular code. Now, on my website, really not all that uh, useful because, I mean, my god, I could find that code pretty fast myself. But if you go to something like facebook.com, and oh, you know, it's kind of interesting how they uh, let's say, put their fi form field up here. How did they do that? That seems pretty advanced. Well, right click, inspect element, and my god, they cleaned up that mess that was the source code we looked at earlier. This is what Firebug does. And now notice it's right in here that they do that. And again, if you haven't caught on to this yet, if I hover over the various tags, notice it's showing me exactly how it's being implemented. So they apparently used a table here. 
There it is. What's the first table row? It's there. What's the second table row? Down there. You can really reverse engineer websites um, to better understand them and to mimic their behavior um, thanks to tools like this. But as we'll see when we get more uh, playful with JavaScript, with tools like this, can you also much more easily reverse engineer JavaScript code? Because it will untangle the mess that is the obfuscation. It can't recover the original variable and function names, but it can at least indent it nicely and format it so that at least a, a skilled JavaScript programmer can figure out what's going on. So just FYI. Um, and as an aside, again, I've preached this before. If you're curious about, I learn CSS to this day this way too. If I'm curious as to what font they used, what size, what color, what background, how did you do that? Again, if I want to hover over something like this TD element, on the right hand side here are all of the CSS properties that apply to that particular TD element from top to bottom with regard to their cascading. It's a really useful way for one, again, learning how other people structure sites and you learn from them this way, and two, chasing down bugs in your own code and your own CSS. Oh my god. I, I honestly, I only discovered this tool a year ago because I think some of the TFs were using it and I totally didn't appreciate what I was missing. So there are other things like this. Safari has its own built-in thing. Uh, Chrome has its own built-in thing. I think uh, IE probably has its own built-in thing. Personally, I find Firebug today uh, to still be the most user friendly, but play with any ones that you would like. So how did I disable this? Let me expand. Let me go back to my checkbox. And what's the difference here? Well, there's this XHTML attribute called disabled. Uh, this is kind of a stupid remnant of years past when you used to be able to just say selected or checked or disabled. Now all attributes in XHTML have to be, have names, equal signs, and values. So the convention is for something like this, which is just disabled, it's disabled equals quote unquote disabled. So it's not true, it's not false, it's not one, it's not zero, it's literally the word disabled. Stupid decisions made somewhere along the way, but that's the way it is. So. Um, that's what disables it by default. So how do I enable it? Well, programmatically, it looks like if I check the box, voila, enabled. Uncheck, check. Uncheck, check. Now, why would I care to do this? Right? This is arguably a bit of a toy program, but when is this compelling? Yeah. Yeah, to prevent people from moving forward until they filled out that form properly. And it's just an enhancement, right? Don't really need it. We made it for years without this kind of functionality. But again, if you're trying to enhance the user experience, and a lot of our favorite websites are very good at these kinds of enhancements, it's relatively easy to do. Plus, for our purposes today, it gives us a chance to manipulate a very simple property with some JavaScript code. So how do we do it? Let's go into Form 5. Again, these are all among your printouts. Fast forward to the XHTML, just to show there's no trickery here. Same exact source code. But notice this. I've added another event handler to my checkbox. And that is dot, dot, dot. Uh, toggle, or on click is the event handler. So on click is yet another attribute, like on submit. And you can pretty much guess what this does, right? On clicking this button, what code should get executed? Apparently a function called toggle. Now that's not a built-in function. I just chose that name myself. So let me scroll to the top of my page, and it's actually pretty simple. My toggle function, whoops, um, my toggle function has four lines of code. If document.forms.registration.button.disabled is true implicitly, what do I do? Make it false. Else, make it true, hence the name toggle. So that's all it takes is a toggling of this XHTML elements property from false to true or true to false. That's all it takes to do that. I still have a validate function in here, but there's no difference. I just stole the code from the previous example. All right, so example six. So I don't have to write all of my JavaScript code in separate functions in my head. Sometimes, even I today, kind of inline it. If I'm writing, if I just need one line of JavaScript code, it's for a site that, you know, I don't mind being a little sloppy, a little loose here and there just to get the job done, and especially since I'm not going to call this code anywhere else. You can inline JavaScript too. So realize this is, in some situations, I would say somewhat reasonable. So notice what I've done this time. I ditched my toggle function, and I just replaced it. Even though my line is long, um, again, trade off. Notice what I've done. Um, next to my agreement checkbox, I have on click again on the right-hand side, but I just wrote some actual JavaScript code in there. My toggle function really didn't do all that much. Do I need a function called toggle that I only call one place? Maybe not. Maybe not, but we can disagree on the design decision. So document.forms.registration.button.disabled equals 
its inversion, thanks to the bang operator here. That achieves exactly the same result. I now have a line of code that just works. I haven't factored it out. So maybe it's not the cleanest, but let's just take this as a lesson in inlining JavaScript. You know the stuff between quotes will get be executed, so you can put more sophisticated code there. And notice what I don't have in this quoted string. In the on submit, I needed to do what with the return value? Yeah, I returned either true or false. So on submit cared about the return value. Uh, on click doesn't care about the return value. It's not going to stop you in this case from clicking it. Other questions? Yeah. Um, you know, that's a good question. It feels like the answer should be yes. So let's try that. First, let's go. Uh, uh, let's go up here. Close this. So da 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 da. That's oh, and this is form six. Let's go to six. Okay, so this is before, current version. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to say this dot disabled. This dot disabled, correct? Okay, let me reload. Oh, <laughs> um, no, sorry, I should have seen that coming. Um, yeah, so it works. Um, doesn't implement the feature we wanted. Um, so yes, you can use this, but I very awkwardly discovered I just disabled the button. So now I'm kind of painted into a corner. So this works, but it's contextually inappropriate here because it's the wrong object in question. So there are other ways to do it, but for now, let's just um, the, the goal here was simply the, in the end lining. But that would, would have been a nice, uh, elegant enhancement. So let's take a look at this, because right now, email address, really not validating it. I'm just saying, is it there or not? I'm not even checking, is there an at sign? Is there a TLD? Is there a username? So JavaScript supports regular expressions. There's a couple of ways it does this, but the easiest one to get started with is this. And so uh, project two and three require a bit of client-side validation on your part. You can do this with relatively little effort, thanks to the match function. So in JavaScript, strings are objects. So anytime we've talked about values of form elements, I talked about them as values, but they're really objects, string objects, very similar in spirit to Java. Um, and even in uh, not like PHP. In PHP, they're primitives, strings are. Uh, but in Java, they're objects, as you know. Same deal here in JavaScript, even though we don't declare types explicitly. So again, long syntax, most of it's familiar. But now I get down to email.value. And notice what's nice about strings, by nature, being objects, they have various methods associated with them. So one is called match. So if you take any string object, dot .match, you can pass in a regular expression, and match will return true or false to you. Now, I don't know historically why this decision was made, but it's among the, frankly, stupider uh, pieces of syntax, I think, in the language, even though there's relatively few. You don't have to quote the string. You just literally put slash and then slash, and inside of the argument, do you put your regular expression. So this just seems weird to me, frankly. I see no reason why this couldn't be a string itself. But such is the way it is. So note it, what uh, could some uh, brave volunteer walk us through this regex. What is this saying from left to right? Yeah? Any character before the at symbol? Any character before the at sign, and how many of them? One or more. So dot means any character, plus means one or more of any character. Then a literal at sign, then what? Any character, one or more times, then a literal dot, hence the escaping of the dot with the backslash, then dot edu. And what's the dollar sign mean? end of the line, which means it's got to end with .edu, not .education, not .educause, .edu, end of string. That's what the dollar sign does. So uh, in casual terms, what kind of email address am I requiring of users? Just an educational address, right, a .edu address. So does that um, regular expression force validation of a lowercase edu? Uh, it does in this case. It does uh, enforce, it does require a lowercase in this case. And in fact, this, <coughs> go ahead. Um, good question. The best way to answer that, I'm trying to remember what the function is in JavaScript. JavaScript to is lower, to lowercase. Uh, yeah, OK, just wanted to confirm lest I misspeak. So to lowercase is a built-in function. 
So what I can do is chain these things together, which is really nice, because this will return a new string object. So I can do dot to lowercase dot match. So that would address that problem there. And just to toss this out there, we won't preach this because it's a little weird, but uh, I could do something like this. If mailin at post.harvard.edu dot match um, slash dot plus add dot plus slash plus dot edu, this would actually return true because I'm taking a string object that happens to be inside of double quotes, still a string, still an object, so you can do crazy things like this. Wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but realize this is actually one of the things that's kind of neat about JavaScript too because it's so consistent. If you have a string, it's an object automatically and you can perform method calls on it. So just FYI there. So notice, to be clear, all I've done is make a literal string on the fly that I get an object because that's what the behavior is defined as. OK, so this is an OK regular expression. A lot of ways to mess with me. What's an email address? Instead of typing, let me do it here. Um, what's an email address that this regular expression would accept nonetheless? What's that? So anything educational. So mailin at post.harvard.edu. But what about this guy? He would be considered valid, at least with this regular expression, because we just said any character one or more times, at any character one or more times. An at sign is itself a character. So realize this is not very rigorous checking. Maybe it's enough to get the job done. So again, it's just a trade off, right? How high do you want to raise the bar? If you're doing regular server side checking, maybe this catches 90% 90 of mistakes. But we could certainly be more rigorous, whether it's in PHP or in JavaScript. Frankly, implementing email address support in a regular expression that's perfectly in accordance with the RFC, the standard that defines email addresses, really a pain in the neck. So almost always do people simplify what the specification says. But please, if you ever implement a website that I visit, please know about subdomains because they are quite common. And also, this is also a legit email address to have plus signs in an address. And I've seen websites that disallow those as well. And as an aside, uh, for the geeky types in the room, what's you a lot of mail servers actually support plus signs in the username, but any mail sent to this address or sent to this address will actually get delivered to mail-in at post.harvard.edu's inbox. So this, this is becoming less necessary now that spam prevention is getting better, but people back in the day, geeky friends of mine that taught me this, would actually sign up, for instance, for Amazon with this address or Dell with this address, and then they could filter much more effectively on the inbound email by checking the two line um, but it would still be delivered to them. So you had essentially had an infinite number of email addresses thanks to most mail server support for the plus sign in this way. But I tried doing that once and it got rejected and then I realized this is kind of a stupid habit to get into, but it exists. Okay, question here. Is what? It's very tedious and lengthy for a user. And for a proper email validation according to the RFC standards. So how about using filter validate email which is provided by the user? So absolutely. So in general, I would say for the course or certainly in real life, um, like using libraries for things like this that are fairly tedious is the way to go. So unless like the project specification says use a regular expression because we think it's a useful intellectual exercise, by all means you should be using the right tools for the job. And again, the line here too, as we've discussed um, over time on like the bulletin board is elsewhere, uh, it's fine to look for like a library for email address validation. Looking for a library that implements CS75 finance, kind of over the line. But so there's a line there too. But sure, in general, why you reinvent some of these wheels unless it itself is meant to be the course's lesson. Other questions? Okay, so let's take a look at what else exists in PHP and how we can make use of this uh, in the time to come. So PHP supports arrays. Not much drama there. Supports a couple of different syntaxes. So one, you can actually declare an array using the constructor 
and that's a bit of a white lie, uh, called array, capital A. And that returns to you an empty array, just like lowercase array is a function in PHP that gives you an empty array. More common and better supported is using empty square brackets like this. This gives you an array. Now, how do you put data into a, a JavaScript array? Just like you would any other language like this. But you can do it differently. You can, actually, sorry, uh, damn, wrong segue. Um, actually, no, but you can also do it this way. So a clever way in JavaScript, at least, that you can't do in a lot of languages is to keep adding elements to the array without having to manually index yourself. So JavaScript arrays are really vectors. They grow automatically, and you don't have to manage the memory yourself. So a.length, length is a property of any JavaScript array. So this is a common approach, especially in a loop or where you don't have a numeric value, like a counter i or j or k or whatever. This is a very common approach if you want to append elements to your array, to your vector, and not have to worry about where you currently are in the array itself, because on the first line of code here, a bracket a dot length gets foo. What is a dot length when I've just initialized my array? Zero. And just to be clear, the first two lines up top are mutually exclusive. Use one or the other. Use the other. Use the second one. I don't mean to say you do both of them. So initially, the length is zero. So a bracket a dot length is a bracket zero. But then automatically is this property incremented for you. You don't increment it yourself. So this is equivalent in the end to this very simple example. So useful trick. So um, when can we, let's see. There are other functions now. Now things start to get a little more useful. So when you log into the course's website, you see a form like this. What's really useful about this website, and lots like it, is that I don't have to click in the text box. The cursor is already blinking there. And I think I even teased us with this a while ago and realized, actually, at the time, one of my lines was a code was superfluous. All it takes to actually focus the cursor on an element, and I'm using that word deliberately, is to call a function that comes with all form elements built in called focus. So whereas in the past, I would do document.forms.registration.email.value, I can instead do email.focus, call a function called focus, and that would move my cursor to that blinking box. And this is so underutilized on a lot of popular websites, and it's completely annoying to have to move your mouse. Maybe I'm a little spoiled, but move your mouse and click in the form field when that's the sole purpose of the page. So realize. Um, you should certainly be doing little things like this. And actually, I fast forwarded because I didn't want you to see my stupid mistake here, but I'll fess up. Um, I sh did not need to do, I'll clean this up and then we'll pretend it was never a bug. Well, it's not a bug, it's just a useless, li useless lines of code. So here is a snippet of code that would accomplish exactly what that page does. So if the login form's username field's value is blank, what field do I assume I should focus on? The username, and that's why the if condition says call the focus function. Else, if it's not blank, probably means that the user tried logging in, maybe I rejected their password, they're back at the form, and I've pre-populated the fields with their username, but not their password, so I focus instead on the password field. So, so relatively simple, but the syntax is all now very familiar, and the lesson here is that just as strings are objects and have methods, just as form fields are objects and have values, they too also have methods. How do you know it exists? You take a class like this, you read a book, you read a website, you read the official documentation, you pick it up as you go. And here too, there's really relatively few good, I think, authoritative sources on all of the functions and methods. That's why we offered you the sort of shotgun approach of a few of them. OK, so realize that there are other approaches to things like regular expressions. And I chose the most simple approach using the match function. But if you start reading up on stuff like this, especially in the docs, you'll see that there's a full-fledged class called regex, whereby you can actually compile, in some sense, you can optimize your regular expression queries, which is important for, say, the most uh, computationally expensive sites, if you really care about uh, performance and calling a function like this a lot. But let me pull up the string classes documentation on Mozilla's site, which is here. Just to give you a sense, oh, damn it, the link is now bounced. Okay, this is another lesson. Don't break your links on websites, especially when you're famous websites like this, because it really annoys the users. So I will figure out where the new version of that is. But let me go to our W3 schools. So W3 schools. 
uh, JavaScript string. Good. This is a really good. So I love the site because it's pretty thorough, but they're not very, uh, they don't offer innumerable examples. They're kind of light. But at least it's a starting point to know it exists. So for instance, we've seen, uh, what did we see already? We saw the match function. There it is here. We saw two lowercase, and there's a bunch of other functions as well. So this is not a bad site, at least to start with, because it's kind of a nice bootstrapping site to see what exists in the way of functions and properties. So do start there, uh, perhaps, when looking for other features still. OK, so there's some other global objects. So uh, JavaScript, again, and we'll come back to this, isn't really a class-based languages. There's no keyword class. Um, but you can instantiate objects, but you instantiate objects with the new keyword by really just calling the name of a function that by convention is capitalized. So we'll, we'll tease some of this apart, but realize um, JavaScript's kind of different from the object-oriented languages that you're probably familiar with. But there are these built-in global objects. The word array, uh, Boolean date, function itself, the, there's a math library, regular expression, and string. For our purposes for the course, we'll pretty much focus on strings, objects, math, date, and array. Um, so about half of them. And we'll see, you'll see them often used implicitly, like two square brackets means array. You don't necessarily have to mention the, fun the object name itself. So what's an object? Well, in JavaScript, they're incredibly useful, especially when we get to Ajax. Thank God for these things called objects, because they make code so relatively easy. So Ajax, once upon a time, stood for asynchronous, JavaScript, and XML. Less so these days, because it used to be XML that folks like Google Maps and other dynamic websites would use to marshal information from server to client uh, to give them more data. But XML is very verbose, as you know. And for bandwidth, not so ideal. Traversing XML data, traversing a DOM in JavaScript, is a pain in the neck. Um, there's way too many function calls to make it a fun process. And that's partly because the W3 specification mandates a very reliable but very generic interface for navigating XML, and it means you have to write lots of lines of code to do simple things. So we'll tend to preach in the course, we'll introduce all uh, using XHTML return values from servers, uh, XML and JSON, but JSON, I would say JSON, JavaScript Object Notation, is very much in vogue, and even I've started using it for most everything because it just helps you get the job done succinctly and quickly, and really at no downsides. So it's kind of a win for everyone. So here is a definition of an object. You can instantiate an empty object with the object constructor, per the first line. More common is just to use curly braces. What's nice about an object is that an object in JavaScript is like PHP's associative arrays. Um, it's not a perfect comparison because PHP has objects as well. Um, and PHP objects can have functions, but PHP associative arrays can't have functions. But if you've gotten a little comfortable with associative arrays in PHP using square bracket notation, indexing into them, you can do the same thing in JavaScript. And this is great, because an associative array is essentially a hash table. A hash table is sort of the Swiss army knives of data structures, because just this very simple mental model of key value pairs, putting something in, getting it out, and not having to worry about how it's implemented is generally quite useful. So we'll start using objects a great deal. And there's actually two different syntaxes you can use. You can treat an object in sort of Java-like notation and do object name dot property name. So object dot key equals value. But it is identical to index into it with quotes and square brackets like I have in the fourth line of code there. Now, a way you can define elements in array is also like this. If I want to create an object on the fly, and this too will become more common in your own code, odds are, var object means give me a variable uh, called obj. Don't know what type it is yet until we, after the assignment operator. Ah, the curly braces mean here comes an object. And the way in which you define key value pairs statically by defining them on the fly here, it's key colon value. And we'll see this approach uh, very commonly, especially as we get to AJAX. JavaScript object notation essentially means you're going to return to the browser something that looks like that thing between curly braces. Yeah? Comma, comma, comma. Yep, but no trailing comma, i.e. doesn't like that. All right, so what about event handlers? There's a lot you can do with browsers, right? We looked at on uh, click and on submit. There's bunches of others. And here's a non-exhaustive list. Um, the most popular years ago was probably which one or which two, would you say? 
Yeah, it's a mouse over, right? It was very cool in like the mid 90s, late 90s to have I, uh, images that if you rolled your mouse over them, they changed, right? That was kind of the extent of JavaScript back in the day, but it was done by way of these basic fundamentals um, on mouse over, on mouse out, which means when you go over it or when you go out of it, even though it's not quite the opposite there. Same, but it is the idea. You can detect clicks, you can detect the mouse going down, the mouse going up, keystrokes going down, keystrokes coming up. You can detect all sorts of things. So how are these things useful? Well, on this example before of our map site, how is this little autocomplete feature implemented when I type an M? Well, my JavaScript code, once I've typed a couple of letters, it realizes, oh, David's finger came up twice, Two characters must have been inputted. Let me now analyze his input and show him some suggestions. Let me keep going. T, update, H, update, E, R, space, H, O, uh, U. Come on. Oh, it's going to match both of them. Damn it. It's not going to go any. So close. OK. But that, the point is that how is that, that very neat and very omnipresent technology implemented? Very simple JavaScript handlers. Even Google has very recently really embraced this. They've made their website kind of uglier, but hey, they still do pretty well. Um, let's do like CS75 Harvard. Oh, good. We're the only ones here. Um, this too, very simple event handlers. And in fact, if you want to poke around, Google is actually an interesting case because let's pull up Firebug. Whoops. Uh, let's pull up Firebug here. There's really, as we've seen, there's really not much to Google's website. And a fun at-home exercise, if you're really the geeky type, might be to try to reverse engineer some of the JavaScript they're using, because there's not all that much, frankly, on their web page. But we, too, could implement this. And as you may have noticed, too, they also maintain the presence of the buttons now. So down here, this is a new thing as of a few weeks ago, too. They include the buttons here. So frankly, it's funny that it took Google years to roll this stuff out. It's as though their JavaScript person is like just learning these new tricks and trying them out on the home page. So um, anyhow, um, very simple ideas that are clearly being used uh, universally. Yeah. How do they come up with Ajax. So let's actually take a peek. So Ajax. Ajax, casually speaking, means uh, just making, uh, you, you do an HTTP call to get the home page or whatever, and then you can send subsequent HTTP requests to the server and get responses back without reloading the whole page, without changing the URL. So what's happening, I'm going to guess, let's see, because odds are Google did not just download to my browser a billion uh, suggested keywords that it's then going to search with JavaScript. Odds are it's happening server side. So let's see, C, uh, oh, yeah. At the moment I type the first character, they sent some stuff across the wire, and it looks like they sent this. They hit this URL behind the scenes, clients1.google.com slash complete slash search, and then let's see, Q. Q equals C. That was the first letter I typed. So they sent a request, which I can now mimic. Let's actually see, because I've never done this myself. Let me copy the URL. Let me open it with my browser. Ah, interesting. So what I get back, it's a little cryptic. Let me go ahead and open like a text editor where we can see this a little better. <laughs> Maybe that's not that helpful. So what is this? This is JSON, almost. It's kind of a white lie, because they actually returned a function call to me. Um, but inside of that function call is a parameter, which is what data type? It's an array, because of the square brackets. So what they have returned to me, this is kind of clever and efficient of them. They've returned to me a line of JavaScript code whose first argument is an array, uh, which apparently has data like the letter I typed in. There's apparently some keystrokes, Unicode or something. It's probably for bold-facing purposes, uh, all those funky characters. And what this function, window.google.ac.h, probably does is a function that was already downloaded to my browser. And past this argument, triggers that pop-up and populates it with the values in this array here. So this is more cryptic than the stuff we'll typically generate. But again, Google's got to pay for every byte. So this is just a very compact representation of this feature. So even after tonight, to be honest, I mean, a lot more, if not already, um, should be, I think, um, accessible conceptually, because uh, it really doesn't take all that much to implement. So what else can you do with JavaScript? You can manipulate CSS, realize. So a lot of the dynamic changes that happen in websites these days are applied simply by changing an element's style or by its class. So an example of this, do I have anything off the top of my head? I'll show you one in just a moment. Uh, okay, will I? Uh, <laughs> 
I'm trying to think of the last time I used this approach. Can't think of a good example, so I'll, come, I'll get back to you, because I do use this, just not recently. Um, so just realize that you can affect the style of an element of a tag in a web page by controlling these properties. Every element in a DOM had these two properties, and why don't I promise to come up with something uh, equivalent, uh, something interesting over time. So here's one, actually, here we go, good. I did my homework. Um, here's a function called blinker. So one of my goals in life um, last year when I whipped up this example was to re-implement the blink tag. It was really hurt that they took it away in almost every browser, but thankfully to JavaScript and CSS, I can bring it back. So this function here is called blinker. Notice the first line of real code calls a function document.getElementsByName. This is a built-in function. Pretty much does what the function name says. It gives me an array of all of the elements in the page that have a name of blink. So any tag that has name equals quote unquote blink will be returned to me in an array, an array of objects. My ne I next induce a loop. So the var keyword in JavaScript uh, creates a uh, variable. Uh, it's not strictly necessary. There are subtle differences. You can just say uh, i gets zero, and that will be a variable, or you can say var i gets zero. For now, they're mostly equivalent, but sometimes it becomes global, sometimes it doesn't, depending on whether you use the keyword. You'll see both approaches. So what am I saying? If the ith blinks element dot style dot visible equals visible, what do I want to do? I want to make it hidden, else I want to make it visible. So if I'm familiar with this CSS, the visibility property either shows something or it hides it, but unlike the display property, it makes sure it's still taking up space. So it won't shrink the DOM. It won't shrink the web page just because you're hiding it. It will just hide it. So this is useful because now if I call this blinker function once every half a second, what will happen to all of the named blink elements on my page? So on, off, on, off, on, off using some JavaScript and using some CSS. And actually, I just thought of where I used this last. So on this site, our events website for Harvard events, you can click on events names like this one here and get more descriptions. So the way I actually implement this is as follows. Let's see if we can use Firebug to our advantage here. I'm going to right click on this or control click, inspect element, and let's see. Let's see if I can demonstrate what's going on with this little debugger here. So here is the table row. I'm hovering over the TR for career transition work group. Notice I've got a little table here. There's the TD on the left, TD there, TD there, TD there, here. And now notice this guy. I hover over him, and he's not there. Because it turns out this TR, by default, has a display of none. So it's a little light, but can you see display none? So this event site I implemented as follows. The results that come back via AJAX are just table row table row, table row. But every other row is hidden because every other row contains what based on the click I just did a moment ago? Description. The description, the more information. So essentially I wanted to have a summary and then I wanted the description, but by default I wanted the description to be hidden, but I, after trial and error, I wanted everything to still line up the same. So I kind of needed to put the data there. I needed to put the description there, but just hide it and collapse it so that it doesn't look like it's actually there. So the approach I decided to take was I hide, by default, using CSS, every other table row. And I do that with display none. So what happens with my code is this. Those links are not hyperlinks per se to other web pages. Notice that it actually calls void zero, just to kind of, uh, which is a, uh, just a typical trick of, let me see if I can zoom in. I can't zoom in and move the mouse at the same time. But in the bottom left corner, it says JavaScript void uh, zero. This just makes sure that when you click the link, it will not go to another website. So I've actually registered with that uh, link that I'm hovering over. Uh, it's a href, and then some stuff, and then on click equals quote unquote foo, where foo is some function whose name I forget. So what does the foo function do? The foo function figures out what the ID is of the description. And my convention was D for description and then a number, which uniquely identifies that row. So I essentially do document .get element by ID, quote unquote, D166833. And what do I then do? I change its style dot display to, quote unquote, not uh, none, but uh, not visible, but block in this case. And that's a bit of a white lie. It depends on the browser. Sometimes it's table row, or sometimes it's block. 
But the effect is, let's try it and see how good Firebug is at keeping up. I'm going to click Career Transition Work Group, and voila. It became un, oh, some of you were looking down. Let's do it again. OK, so right now it's very light. And I'm, the projector's fidelity is not perfect here. But I'm going to click the link. And now notice Firebug realizes that I've changed the style. And it even highlighted it. It changed it to table row, um, which is a subtlety required for certain browsers. So actually, I'm glad. I, I had already did use this very recently. And there's different ways you can do this, to be sure. But this was one way, by altering the CSS properties of an element to hide it or not hide it. And in this way, I make one query. I get back all of the data at once, and I just hide half of it so that there's no delay either. I didn't want stupid progress bars or delays. If someone clicked that link, I want to show them the description. And so CSS is the fastest solution for something like that. OK, so um, how do we actually make the blink function, the blinker function, blink every half second? Well, there's different ways. But here, I'll actually preach um, uh, a library and the solution at the same time. So notice the middle line of code there. Window is another global object. Document is one that you get for free within the confines of your browser. Window is another. Um, they just have different roles. Window.location refers to your browser's window, uh, to the address bar. Uh, window.setInterval is a function associated with the window. And what it does is it sets a timer. So what I'm telling the browser to do with this line of code is call the blinker function with no arguments every 500 milliseconds. So, and I know this from reading the documentation. So this induces essentially an infinite loop or thread that wakes up every 500 milliseconds, does something, then goes back to sleep. What does it do? It calls the blinker function. So the effect in the end is to animate the blink tag in perpetuity for as long as this page is active. Now, when do I call this function? Well, I wanted to introduce you to this thing. So YUI is useful for a bunch, uh, bunch of reasons. One of them is because it standardizes how you can add listeners to elements on the page. So notice my first line of code, yahoo.util.event.addListener. What do I want an ad to add a listener to? The window object. Okay. What do I want to listen for? The load event. So you may recall, or you may have used yourself um, this tag, maybe in yesteryear. You would do something like, whoops. You would do something like body on load. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize the time. Uh, body on load equals something. Anyone do this before? It's the same idea. But this allows us to actually associate multiple functions with the load function. So just to wrap up here, lest we get uh, ushered out, um, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of libraries. This list here that you have a printout of is perhaps some of the most popular ones. So we won't overemphasize YUI necessarily. This website here is a wonderful resource. Now that you're really going to start banging your head against the wall when it comes to cross-browser differences, this fellow here has really a nice reference where he spent a lot of time figuring out what works where. We'll talk in next week, probably, about ways of compressing your code and obfuscating it using something called JSLint um, and also these compressors, uh, four of which are among the most popular. So perfect ending, hopefully, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>